is an interior life? Where do I find the deep place? What does it mean for me to choose an intentional relationship to my interior life? Uh, I was asked to speak today on the material in chapter 4. I thought to myself, boring. <laughs> then I read the chapter. Boring. <laughs> so today instead I'd like to talk about sex. For a long time in recent history, no one was talking about sex. Now, yes, uh, everyone had a sex life. Uh, everyone thought about sex. Everyone had sexual practices and activities. But no one was talking about it. Sex was taboo. And then in 1947, a guy named Alfred Kinsey raised the question, what if we started exploring people's sexual activities and personal practices? What if we started studying that? The world hasn't been the same since. <laughs> Now today, you and I participate in a deeper, more pervasive, more severe taboo than the taboo about sex. And this is the taboo about our personal interior lives. We don't really talk about it, don't acknowledge it publicly. We um, mostly try to avoid exploring it. Sometimes we don't even acknowledge to ourselves that we have one. We practice often living on the surface of life. We're pretty good at, at talking about the weather, about the score of yesterday's football game, Pretty good at talking about the latest sales at the mall, gossiping about our neighbors, our friends, our families. Pretty good at those things. Sometimes we even talk about how we feel about those things. But it often doesn't go much deeper. The interior life is taboo. So, what is the interior life? Which way is within? Where is within? Well, here's something I think I've figured out. Uh, within is within the body. Now, that may sound like a silly thing to say. However, early on in life, most of us begin to practice living out there. We begin to practice living our lives, trying to live our lives by what other people are doing, by what other people are thinking, by what we think they're thinking, by what other people are feeling, by what's on the TV. We practice living our lives out there and we get disconnected from the experience of our experience, which in fact happens in our bodies. So what is the interior life? The interior life The interior life is full of sights and sounds 
and songs and stories and myths and rituals and dreams and fantasies. And the interior life is full of every memory, of every encounter, of every experience, of every event in your life. And especially the ones you think you've forgotten. The interior life is full of every thought we've ever, ever thought, every judgment we've ever held, every opinion. Interior life is full of every fear and every worry and every concern, real or imagined, that has ever passed through this being. It's full of, of every love and every care and every romance we've ever had. The interior life at a deeper level is full of states of being which are deeper than thoughts or feelings. Some of which we know, some of which we will get to know. But that is, that collection of all of that is the interior life. And it, it all works together to create a palette of choice, a palette of freedom, out of which you and I have an opportunity to paint the picture of each day of our lives or to write the script of the play, the drama that we have an opportunity to enact on the stage of our lives. We seem to be wading into some deep water. May we take a time out here? When connecting with this deep place, is this what we mean by spirit or spiritual? These are certainly words contemporary popular culture often uses to point to the deep place. These words are pretty and feel good, but because of common usage, overusage, and misuse, these words can feel fuzzy and may orient me out of my life, rather than more deeply into my life. For the purpose of this journey, let's talk about freely chosen relationships. Do you mean like my family relationships or the relationship in space of one material object to another? No, I am pointing to the choices and intentions and decisions we constantly make forming our fundamental postures toward life. I take the freedom I am at my most essential level and consciously or unconsciously choose a relationship. This activity of choosing relationships is the essence of who I am. What we once described as spiritual practices or exercises, we will now, for clarity, discuss as relational practices or relational exercises. Hmm, you may have lost me here. Hang with me. If you can learn to see life through the clear screen of freely chosen relationships, the deep place is right around the corner. We understand having a relationship with our pets, our spouse, or our children. We also have a relationship with the wholeness of reality. This whole, this mysterious whole, is a process moving towards us in every moment, challenging the depths of our being. And we are responding to this challenge, either in flight or fight, or openness. This God is not a being among other beings, not a supernatural thing among other supernatural things, not a thing at all, not a person, not a being, but be as a whole.
A disciplined mind leads to happiness, and an undisciplined mind leads to suffering. Mastery over the external universe is not going to add one jot to how good we as individuals feel, or reduce the chaos of the world as we experience it. To do that, we must learn to achieve mastery over consciousness itself. We are entering the dimension where we have control, the inside. Go inside to experience what already exists within you, unchanging, immovable, ever present, ever waiting. No teacher is necessary. You are the teacher you've been waiting for. You are the one who can end your own suffering. Notice when your thoughts argue with reality. The only time we suffer is when we believe a thought that argues with what is. When the mind is perfectly clear, what is is what we want. I think it's more important today than ever to have an intentional interior life, because I think the challenges today are great with all the screens. Oh my gosh, all the little screens and big screens and sit in a room with a huge screen and here's a screen in your pocket and um, it's everywhere and all the distractions are everywhere and we kind of live outside of ourselves out there. And when we do that, I think we're living on, on the surface of life. You know, we're just kind of bouncing around and from one thing to another to another to another and the ability to hold a focus is more and more of a challenge. And so I think, I think we have to decide what kind of life do I want to lead? What kind of person do I want to be? What do I want to bring forth into the world? You know, to make a decision and think about what do I want to do and how do I want to be means that we have to pay attention. You have to pay attention and create that life for yourself. Because without paying attention, we will constantly bounce from one thing to another and not be anchored in anything, not have the depth of character to create the best that we can bring forth into the world. So when we have an intentional interior life, we're saying, I am honoring myself. I am honoring the dignity of my life. I am paying attention to um, this gift of life that I hold and develop to bring forth. So an intentional interior life, I think, is crucial for joy, for happiness, for uh, how to find our way in, in all of the challenges and the pain and suffering as well for life. Simply being in a state of attention and paying attention is how you practice mindfulness in life. Attention and personal attention, uh, it's, it's all personal, right? But. Um, when you enter, when you live uh, with, within a state of attention, um, being aware that attention is how you understand at a deeper level, then it allows you simply to be more mindful in life. Mindfulness is how you sit yourself in the present moment, how you feel your body, how you are aware of your thoughts, your feelings, your past, and 
paying attention. It's basically that. Attention has many levels, right? We can be paying attention when we are um, in this regular normal state of consciousness. We can have a different level of attention when we are in meditation or when we are in a state of trance. And probably those deeper states of attention um, can, they have the ability, the capacity to bring a lot more information um, so that you can see where it is that you uh, want to move towards or things that you need to change, things that you hadn't seen before about yourself. And so really paying attention in those deeper states allow you to grow in a much more enjoyable, productive uh, way. And truly, if you are an adventurer, and if you are curious enough, and if you are rebellious enough, then I would say you really want to be paying even more attention to what you are conforming to, to what you are choosing to allow in your life. And by paying attention and by being curious, you decide that you can, in fact, um, change that around if you want to. You can, and you have the ability and the power to be something other than what you have been told to be, or what society is telling you to be, or what you have been up until now. Probably the one thing I would say is that um, meditation is probably one of the most uh, accessible hypnagogic uh, practices that you can do to yourself, that you can do on your own. And it um, it is the way we have now, it is the tool that we have now for personal transformation and change, for spiritual expansion, to access our own creative potential and to become that creator that we are inside and to live from that center. So this is probably the most important thing that we can do in life is to pay attention to that creative seed that we carry and to live from that. Well, it seems to me that one of the dissatisfactions of the young generations, the millennials and the ones after them, is the dissatisfaction with institutions, religious institutions. And nevertheless, there is a desire for the transcendent, the, the experience, the mystical experience of love and of some depth, in-depth interiority and meaning. That's real. And so I give them poetry to read and things to, to find language, because Heidegger is correct here too, that language is the house of being. And the more language we have, the more rich consciousness can be. And I find that poetry is one way of doing it. I do that with my students at the... And there's a wonderful man named Walter Brueggemann. He talks about how we've become a world of flattened prose flattened prose, memos, text messages, and tweets, rather than the beauty of, of language that can come when you dwell, dwell, dwell in the beauty of language. Most recently, over the past three or four years, I've been working with them on interiority as part of the presiding style, because there's no way that we can engage these rituals without some sort of interior life. And I was validated on that this summer. Validated. I was on a retreat this summer at a farm outside of Paris, La Ferme, with Jean Vanier. There's a community called L'Arche Communities. 
the L'Arche communities are communities around the world that have been established for people with um, learning and developmental disabilities, emotional disabilities. Uh, Down syndrome was the word I believe we used previous. And Jean Vanier was a kind of like a St. Francis. He was a military man. He left the military dis totally disengaged by war and violence. And um, he, um, he, he went on for a PhD in philosophy and psychology at La Sorbonne in France, where I might have gone. And, uh, and then he realized the suffering of people who were locked up in their homes because of this, of Down syndrome, this developmental disability, and they were locked up and put to shame, and, and in some cases even chained, and he saw that brutality in France. And he was inspired with a group of others to do something about it, and so he created these communities called L'Arche. I think the word L'Arche means bow, like a rainbow. And, um, and so he's 88 now, and he has communities all over the world. And that was the place we went for retreat. And so I, I presided at Eucharist there, and he came up to me and thanked me. And, but then I asked him, if you were teaching young priests like I do, how to preside at Mass and how to preach, what would you want to make sure that they experienced and that they knew and, and, and knew deep down knowing? He thought a moment and he said, In interiority. And I nearly fell off my chair. He says, you cannot do any of what you do without some form of interior life. This inside journey of choosing and managing the relationships that orient my life posture is capturing my attention. I am ready to go deeper I am ready to explore the practices of deep listening, deep breathing, and deep talk. I am ready to embrace an intentional interior life. I am ready. Join me in this engagement with the deep place. <laughs>